Good morning and happy Sabbath church. I don't know if I'm not so close to this as to demonstrate my progress to you. Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath and welcome, Church of the Living God. Yes, we want to thank the Lord. I want to welcome our visitors. I can see uh, new faces uh, into church this morning. We know it is still difficult to come to church. It's still a bit scary, but we want to thank the Lord because he is faithful. And um, I can see as well that since we uh, started coming to church every Sabbath, our members are coming in bit by bit. So we want to thank the Lord. Eventually it will work out. God has a plan for us. Yes, um, I want to thank you, Sister Matilda and Sister Cavell. What a lovely song, only God's mighty. We can't, we can't carry the cross, the yoke is heavy. The yoke is heavy, that's why the situation is like this. I want to see the smiles. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I want to see the smiles, but we can't. Yeah, but God is the one who's going to take us through. Yes, uh, Sister Nelson, thank you so much for the lovely welcome. I just pray that what you said, all the good things you said, I hope they just come out of me uh, unknowingly because I, I don't want to put effort in it. Because if I put effort in the good things you see in me, then I'm doing my own works thinking I will end heaven. So I pray that the Lord will work with me so that whatever I do, if it is good as you have said, may other people be blessed as well. I also want to thank Sister Rezna and he, her team, um, women's ministries. I love women's ministries as well as any other department. Uh, I've been in Sabbath school as well and I loved it. <laughs> For some time I was enjoying in Sabbath school and women's ministries as well, now prayer ministries. However, Sister Resna sent me a text. Oh, these are some glasses for somebody I believe. Sister Resna sent me a text and said, Sister Wimbai, please, would you give us a message on Women's Ministry Day? And she gave me the date in August. That was a long while ago, though. And uh, she gave me the theme for the day. And she says, the theme is, end it now. And I'm saying, oh, yes, I know the phrase, end it now. But what is it that we are going to end now? What is it, Sister Rezna? Do you know? <laughs> what are we ending now? And it must end right now. Yes, the phrase, end it now, is here with us. I know one of the greatest challenges we face in our church today is the violence and abuse taking place within the family and within the society. It is a sad fact that many of our sisters, our brothers, our children within church families are suffering from abuse as well. It is my sincere prayer this morning that as we go through the message today, the Holy Spirit will work in our lives to bring conviction and um, um, to take a brave step, step uh, to, 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 to uh, do what we can to serve the Lord. So let us not be so unwise to say that or, and always to believe that, oh, this cannot happen in our families or this not can happen in our churches or in our homes. Let us wake up to the reality and to the importance of this message of abuse and to end it now. So my talk today, I have given it a title, a subtitle from End It Now to Let There Be Love Among Us. Let there be love among us. And as we say, share this message today, may we become examples of God's love in our families and in all those around us, shall we pray. Heavenly Father, we love you because you love us so much. There isn't much we have done, but Lord, we are in the world where it's filled with sin, and it's only you who can take us through. We know this subject of abuse, it has been said many places, in many places, but this abuse is still going on. Lord, we just hold on to you and keep on hanging on to you because you will take us through one day. 
thank you for this time. May the words that I'm going to share with your people not be a time to waste, but something that will help us to live for you till you come to take us home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Right, let me explain a little bit about how this end it now phrase came about. Right, what happened is, um, what happened is in 2001, the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference um, in America, we know where our General Conference is, the Seventh-day Adventist. They took a historic um, step uh, to, to vote that every year, the fourth Sabbath of August, they would dedicate it to an emphasis on abuse prevention. So from that time, that is when they called an abuse awareness or abuse emphasis prevention day. And it carried on until 2012. Um, in 2012, they changed it from abuse awareness day to end it now. So that's why you can see, even if you go to women's ministries around this time and say programs, you just see end it now. You don't see women's ministries emphasis or awareness day. So it came to end it now. So from that time, that's why we always um, do this program on, um, in, in August. So because as a church, they realize that as a church, we know that abuse is not right, yeah? In fact, it is sin, and therefore, the church must address it, even though it is uncomfortable to do so. But still, a lot of people don't want to hear about abuse mentioned at the pulpit. They would rather hear it maybe on news or in the TV or in another church, but not on our, in our church. In their minds, they think such things like they don't, it, those things, they don't happen in our Adventist churches and families. And yet, there are too many who are suffering just from abuse right now. Sometimes we think that the Bible does not talk much about, love, about abuse, but it does talk about it in a different way. In fact, the Bible talks more about love than about abuse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, it says here, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And unless we, took, um, unless we too talk about and address this issue on abuse, we, 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 we become as those sounding brass and clanging cymbal. In other words, we are just talking about love. We say, I love you, I love you, but we are not showing the sentiment of it. Our scripture reading, which um, uh, my sister Jenny read eloquently from uh, Proverbs 31, verse eight and nine, give, uh, it gives us some guidance as to how our Christian duty should be. It says here, yeah, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Speak up for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Depend, defend the rights of the poor and needy. In other words, this scripture is telling us that to remain indifferent and ignoring that there is no such thing like abuse among God's people is to condone or to perpetuate and possibly to extend the effects of abuse. That is why we need to talk about it and make everyone aware of it. So what is abuse? We need to be sure that we are thinking and talking about the same thing and we are talking about abuse. So wanting to know more myself, I went to ask Uncle Gugu on what he says about abuse. So Uncle Gugu says, abuse is when someone causes a harm or distress. It can take many forms, ranging from, from disrespect to causing someone physical or mental pain. That's what um, uh, uh, Gugu told me. My brothers and sisters, we all know that our world today is filled of violence and contempt for one another. 
Society has given birth to a culture of disrespect where the defenseless are exposed and the weak cries for help, but often disregarded. A lack of compassion for hurting is seen in the indifferent response to their expressed needs. Abuse of vulnerable people exists in our world and sadly it has impacted our church. Sometimes this is because of ignorance or fear of being exposed. However, if we are trained to see the wounded through the eyes of love and compassion, we can act justly. Therefore, we should seek to prevent abuse by raising awareness to its negative impact and know what to do when we see these traits of abuse. Let me talk a bit about our children and young people because the, uh, the children and young people are the church of tomorrow. I hope this is every adult person's desire in this church, that the church will triumph when we are gone. I know we need this church to move on when we are gone. So when we look at our young people today, we see that they are not here. We see very few. But those few, they can be a nucleus if they are trained and grounded in the word of God. They can be a nucleus to spread the word of God and bring others back into the fold. Today's world is a dangerous place for our children and young people to grow up. As parents or as a church, we need to have a better understanding of what our young people, our youth, are facing from day to day out there. If we are courageous enough to look at the statistics of violence, bullying, and assault that are happening to our young people in every country, then we will understand that we need to act now and end it now. Technology has expanded the potential of youthful cruelty by making it possible to cyber bullying. Each time, you may, they may not go out. You can have one child in the house. He can be there, she can be there, but she is with many people in the house and which mo most of them will be influencing that young person. The statistics may be disturbing and very uncomfortable to hear, but our community of faith, they are crucial to know if we want to be aware and be able to truly do something for our next generation. You can look at statistics on homicides, on victims of rape, on sexual abuse among our women, young girls, and even young boys. The numbers are unbearable. I'm not going to go into details on statistics to say so much, so much in numbers, but we all agree that the effects of abuse is increasingly getting worse. And the effects are long lasting, affecting the victims' mental health and increasing their risk into more likely to develop symptoms of drug abuse more likely to experience post-traumatic stress disorder as adults and more likely to experience a major depressive episode as adults or even to take their lives. That's how bad it can be. So as loving parents, teachers, and church community leaders, I express again, how can we keep our children safe? What can we do to protect the next generation and help them develop into healthy, strong, confident, safe adults. Again, statistics that uh, show that home, where, old, where children are supposed to be surrounded by adults and older adults, whom they love and trust, is often the most unsafe place for them. Data shows that when cases of child sexual abuse were reported, to law enforcement, 93% of perpetrators are known to the child. And that number, out of that number, 34 are family members or relatives 
while only 7% of perpetrators are actually strangers to the child. The terrifying reality is that far too often, the place where our children begin experience violence is inside the home. Even inside the Seventh-day Adventist church or the Seventh-day Adventist home, those things can happen. When describing Christ's childhood, Luke 2 verse 52 tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with all people. This tells us three things about childhood. One, Jesus grew in a psychological and spiritual maturity. That means wisdom. Two, he grew in physical health and strength. That means stature. And three, he grew in favor with God and all people. That means his character and personality was built there. Was built there. In order to have the greatest opportunity to grow in the wisdom, stature, and favor with God and men, like Jesus did, our children need protection and safety to develop with balance and wholeness. This means they do not only need physical safety, but also emotional, spiritual, even sexual and psychological safety. The solution for preventing adverse child experiences must begin in the Christian home. We love our precious children. <laughs> you cannot talk to, a, to someone who is not a child, I can just say. We love our children. We love them fiercely and fully. We want the best for them. But often we fail to realize that when we are preparing them for lives marred by violence, by, by subjecting them to a lack of safety right at home, then we have lost them. If they are watching um, parents fight or seeing their father attack their mother, home is not safe for them. If they are being molested or abused sexually by family member, home is not safe for them. If they are living in fear of your criticism or harsh words to them, home is not safe for them. If their mistakes and failures are used to shame and control them, still home is not safe. If they are not free to express emotions and fears and concerns, Home is not safe. We cannot control the world around us, but we can do something better at home. We have an inexcusable responsibility before God to raise our children in, in, in safe, loving homes that reflect the tenderness and love of Christ's character. So in order to address the epidemic of aggression among our children and youth in order to reduce violence, peer bullying, child sexual assault, and teen homicide, we must assess the cultural norms that exist inside our homes because that's where the church, the church starts from. We must first address ourselves as faithful parents, faithful grandparents, aunties, uncles, and family friends to our children. When our homes are structured on the concept of power and control, we unknowingly perpetuate or spread cycles of aggression, anger, and hopelessness to our children. The first step to ending these painful cycles is to break the silence and bring the subject into light. The Apostle John writes, God is light. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. This is John just telling us from um, New Testament. No matter how awkward it may feel, we, may begin, uh, we must begin discussing reality in a way that allows for honest, honesty and leads to change. When we, as a global church, avoid hidden, 
uh, uh, when we as a global church avoid uncomfortable topics, preferring to keep things secret and hidden, we allow violence to flourish in private. They only, um, the only way to dispel the darkness is to shine the light of truth upon it and to bring it into light of God's character. John tells us that if someone keeps evil hidden in the dark, they are not true followers of God. So until we break the cycle of, of abuse, we are not following Jesus' command to love one another and to live in the light. First John 2 verses 10 to 11 says, anyone who loves another brother or sister is loving, is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates or abuses another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. When we, ex um, when we exhibit the strength and courage requiring to talk openly and honestly about creating homes filled with kindness and compassion, and when we refuse to protect uh, and enable the familiar habits that endorse a spirit of violence and aggression toward our next generation, the church can, be, uh, can begin to experience revival and healing. Until we do this, we are collectively stealing the treasure of safety and trust from our children's hearts. In doing so, we represent, um, we are misrepresenting God's character. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, Paul says, when we follow the desire of our sinful nature, the results are very clear. What are the results? He goes on to say, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, world parties, and other things like this. And we live that sort of uh, life uh, and, and we live that sort of life, then we must forget about inheriting God's kingdom. And uh, when he was talking, then you, when you, you read this, you just think, is Paul still living today? Those things he wrote way back, but he saw what was happening towards the end of the world. And those things are the ones that are causing so much distress in people's lives. So it may be uncomfortable to recognize that far too often we treat our children at home with more hostility, quarreling, jealousy, angry uh, outbursts, envy, and other forms of emotional and physical aggression than we exhibit anywhere else. Like the two, what was the name, Sister Anita? Like the two Carolines. Yes, we do something different here at church. Yes, Sister Nelson, you see me smiling. When I'm at home, I'm rude to my husband. Yes, you see me uh, maybe in jovial mood. When I'm at home, no, no one comes near me. If we exhibit those characters when we are somewhere else, then forget, I may as well yeah, smile and do everything, but heaven is not for me. That's what, it, that's what Paul is trying to tell us here. Yeah. Our spouses and children become easy targets of our frustration, exhaustion, or irritability. Then they grow up believing these patterns of behavior are normal, and they can treat siblings, peers, whoever in their lives, uh, the same generation, generational pattern. They will do the same because they think that's the norm. That's how we should do it. Ellen White wrote in great detail about home life and the importance of kindness and mutual respect. She says, home, home should be a little heaven upon earth, a place where the affections and cultivated, cultivated instead of being studiously repressed. Our happiness depends upon this cultivation of love, sympathy, and true courtesy for one another. 
the sweetest type of heaven is a home where the spirit of the Lord presides. If the will of God is fulfilled, the husband and wife will respect each other and cultivate love and confidence. And this is from Adventist Home, and it's just from chapter one. Parents, never forget that you are to make the home bright and happy for yourselves and for your children by cherishing uh, the Savior's attributes. Troubles may invade, yes, but that is what life is. Let patience, gratitude, and love keep sunshine in the heart, though the day may be so ever cloudy. The home may be plain, but it can always be a place where cheerful words are spoken and kindly deeds are done, where courtesy and love are the abiding guests. Oh, I know people want guests in their homes, but what type of guests? If you've got such kind of guests who are cheerful, who are loving, who are always uh, uh, um, smiling, and who are supportive. So abuse in whatever form, what, uh, whether experienced as a child or through a violent act or within the home, one thing we must know, it leaves scars that can last a lifetime. So those who have been affected by abuse, let's get reassurance from this. God is our, hel our healer and our helper. In all our pain and trial, he can help us to go through our past by providing reassurance through his word. He can help us to find support in a community of church believers. He can help us to find solace in prayer and develop friendship with him, confiding in him our deepest feelings by talking to him throughout the day as our best friend. The writer of hymn 4.9 understood this kind of prayer when he wrote the words, what a friend we have in Jesus. He goes on to say, precious Savior is still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he will take and shield you and you will find a solace there. That's why he understood that. I know Sometimes it's easier said than done, but when someone has gone into a depressed situation, someone notices it, something must be done because some cannot come out on their own. Something must be done to help that person to find refuge in Jesus. Research tells us that being surrounded by supportive relationships within the outside, uh, within and outside the family is the primary factor for developing resilience. Yes, it is very true that relationships that create love and trust offer encouragement and reassurance to help boost a person's resilience. But Jesus is the most important person in your support network. If we remain open to God's counsel, we experience more positive results in developing resilience. With the wisdom of God, we are able to find um, solution to problems and make plans to move on. You cannot develop resilience in the realm, uh, religious realm without understanding how God feels about you. The most important person in this world to God, listen, the most important person in this world to God is you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He redeems you by his blood. He names you as his heir. He calls you his son. He calls you his daughter. He crowns you with the glory and honor. You are his royal prince and you are his royal princess. He covers you with the robe of righteousness so that you are able to love and forgive like Jesus did. His divine love provides stability, confidence, purpose, and desire to love like Jesus. Praise God. He says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people, all men to myself. That's John 12, 32. 
We live in a world filled with pain, suffering, and evil of every kind, apart from abuse. And we each have our own personal struggles and distress and uh, that distress us and depress us. But we serve a mighty God, a God who is concerned with everything that concerns us, a God who, lo who, who gives a hope and joy in a world longing for peace and healing, a God who loves us so much. So this message is saying, and it's now. And uh, Proverbs is telling us that speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. What are we doing when we see people who are being abused? It is a sacred responsibility to address this issue of abuse and violence in the home and in church. But today, I'm just inviting all of us here that we make this matter, this as a matter of um, uh, heart, in our heart, in search for prayer, what we can do, how we can help. And we can commit beginning today that we want our hearts to be turned in our homes between us parents, between father and mother, between children and parents, and maybe amongst members of our extended family and among members in our congregation and among our young people, if this is your desire, that we need to move on, we need to help each other, we need to be a brother's keeper. This is my prayer for myself, that whatever happens, because so many people, they struggle to come back to church when things like that happen. So many people, they struggle to serve the Lord when those things happen. So many people, they, 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 they neglect themselves. They refuse to believe that they are living. They are human. God still loves them. But we need a heart-searching prayer that what can I do, Lord, to help when I see these things happen? What can I do, Lord, when that mind of abusing someone comes into me? What can I do, Lord, when I am the, um, uh, the, the, um, the person who has been abused? What must I do? Because these things, they will be with us in this world till Jesus comes. But we, these are the things that we must conquer when Jesus comes to take us home. So if it is your prayer that you really, you really feel that we need to support one another. That's where it is. We need to support one another in love. That's why I said, let there be love among us. If it is your need, let us uh, stand up as I uh, present this message before the Lord. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, this is a moment that uh, we need to wake up to because the world is going on another angle. But us, Lord Jesus, you show us the way just to follow you. Lord, we want to thank you for what you have done for us. We want to thank you for this amazing gift which you sent Jesus to die for us. And because of that gift, Lord Jesus, we can ask for forgiveness and we can be forgiven. Because of that gift, oh Lord, we can ask for strength to help those who are in trouble, who are being abused. Lord, whether we are abusers or we are abusing someone, or we, we were doing these things without knowing, we pray that, Lord, you will be with us. You will forgive us and take us uh, as your children. Create in us a clean heart, O oh Lord Jesus, and restore the right spirit within us. We are praying and seeking uh, your leading uh, in our lives. Please, Lord, help us to love each other. Help us to love those who, even those who don't love us. Lord, help us to love those who are going through difficult times. Help us to embrace them and give them courage and support them 
so that they will know you, they will know you are there, Lord. I know as a church family, we may not see things, but Lord, from high above, you see things. So Lord, I pray that because you see things in secret, those that are in secret, which the church doesn't know, Lord, deal with those and help your people out. Those which are open to the eyes of the church, may you help your church to support each and every one of us as we are each brother's keeper. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the spirit of loving one another. Let there be love among us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.